Okay, we'll go ahead and call the meeting to order at uh, 701. Uh, good evening, everyone. Welcome to the West Covina City Council Chambers for the July 10th meeting of the West Covina Planning Commission. Uh, tonight, our Pledge of Allegiance will be led by Commissioner Menifee, and please remain standing for our short uh, prayer. Thank you. Sure. Should we all stand and face the flag and repeat with me? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Hey, roll call, please. Commissioner Valle? Here. Commissioner Holtz? Here. Commissioner Woods? Here. Commissioner Menifee? Here. Chairman Stewart. Here. Do we have any changes or corrections to the amendments of uh, June 12th? All right, hearing none, they're approved as presented. We'll move on to oral communications. This is a time when any member of the public may speak to the commission on any matter within the scope of duties assigned to the commission. Other matters included on this agenda may be addressed when that item is under consideration. For all oral communications, the chairperson may impose reasonable limitations on public comments to assure an orderly and timely meeting. The Ralph M. Brown Act, Act limits the Planning Commission and staff's ability to respond to public comments at this meeting. Thus, your comments may be agendized for a future meeting or referred to the staff. The Commission may ask questions for clarifications if desired at this time. By policy of the Commission, oral communications at this time on the agenda is limited to a total of 15 minutes. Persons who are not afforded the opportunity to speak at this time may do so under item E later on the agenda. I have no speaker cards, but anybody is welcome to speak because the microphone is yours. Anybody? All right, thank you. Hearing none, we'll go ahead down to the uh, consent calendar. I have staff report, please. Three items on the consent calendar tonight. The first one is the forthcoming. We do have items for the uh, next meeting in two weeks on July 24th. Um, we also have a uh, follow-up to a three-month review for a conditional use permit uh, for live entertainment for amazing lights at 220 South Glendora. And we also have an extension of time request for a service station remodel and convenience store at 150 South Citrus at Citrus and Garvey. Be happy to go into any more detail if you'd like me to, or we can just um, go from there. All right. Any commission questions? Anything on the consent calendar? I'd just like to comment about the amazing lights. This is, their, I believe, their second time back. Uh, they've done a, a good job of uh, abiding by the uh, request of the city, and I do support the uh, uh, staff's report to, to just uh, go ahead and receive and file. So with that, I'll entertain a motion for all the items on the consent calendar. I'll make a motion to approve. Second. Motion to approve by Commissioner Holtz, seconded by Commissioner Menifee. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Carries 5-0. Public hearings, we have none. We will go down to the non-hearing -hearing items, which is the number five, which is a study session, a general plan, house element update. Uh, study session to inform the Planning Commission of the housing element update process. May we have um, staff report, please? Yes, um, Senior Planner Fabiola Wong will be presenting the staff report. Thank you. Um, this is just basically an update to understand the process of the housing element, um, not necessarily to go into any detail on what we're going to be bringing forth to you at a public hearing sometime in the next few months, but more to go over the, the overall process um, since most of the commissioners uh, ha weren't, weren't on the commission the last time it was discussed in 2008. So with that, I'll turn it over to Fabiola. Good evening, Chairman and members of the Planning Commission. Um, this is an old PowerPoint. We actually had a workshop, um, probably Commissioner Stewart might remember. He might have been the only one at the, in the Commission at that time. And we did have a public workshop on December 
9th, 2008, where we actually um, send out flyers and you know, we encourage community participation um, to get input from, from different stakeholders and what it will go into the housing element. Um, in your staff reports, basically, um, it tells you that the general plan, um, it's a policy document that cities are required to adopt and it includes seven mandated elements. One of those is the housing element. The housing element is the only one that is mandated to be updated periodically by the state, roughly every five years, sometimes seven years. Uh, recently, they have adopted different um, legislative law that will require it to be adopted every eight years to be concurrent with the regional transportation plan. Uh, back in 2008, June 17th, um, 17th to South 2008, the City Council approved a contract with Hogel Ireland that has been the consultant that has been working with staff in drafting a housing element. Um, hopefully the housing element will be in front of you um, probably late summer, early fall, and this is why we wanted to do this study again, uh, study session, just to kind of go over what the housing element is. Okay, the housing element, um, basically, as I mentioned before, it's mandated by the state, uh, has to be revised as a state dictates or requires, and uh, in the process of updating the housing element, as I mentioned before, we had that workshop um, seeking public input into the process um, to create housing policies and implementation measures that reflect the objectives and priorities of the city of West Covina. Uh, we saw input from city leaders, residents, and stakeholders into, this, into the process, which is crucial. And, um, and that's what was done back in um, December 9th. As mentioned, the general plan has seven required elements. Um, the intent of the housing element is to facilitate the improvement and development of housing for all economic segments of the community. Uh, the general plan is uh, the city's blueprint for guiding physical development and setting city policies. The housing element is one of the seven state mandated elements of the general plan. Identify sites and units of housing in terms of creating opportunities, not actually building them. The state recognizes that the role of, this, of a city is not to build housing, but to create opportunities in their land use plan to facilitate development through their policies. The housing element sets city policies and goals related to housing and identify housing needs in the city for all income groups, specific needs um, groups such as senior, disabled, it also for, um, it basically also breaks down um, income groups are broken down into four categories. As you notice in your staff report, there is a table. And those categories are very low, low, moderate, and above moderate. Certain segments of the population um, that may have more difficulty finding decent, yes. Would you mind a question through this or would you rather we re Hold um, off our questions. No, you can ask the question uh, as we I go. Read, I read the material that was provided to us, and, and I stopped at that point where we were talking about very low, low, moderate, and above moderate. And I thought, what does that mean? Low so means basically that. zero to 30 percent of the median income for Los Angeles County. Yes, and, and it's, yes. It's Go established ahead. by the federal uh, government through the Housing and Urban Development HUD. They're the ones that establish the, the, the standards and, and figure out what exactly that means. And it's different for different parts of the country. Okay. You know, in North Dakota, the very low income is different than it is in L.A. Okay. Um, certain segments of the population, as I was mentioning, may have... I'm sorry. Yes. So you tell me what very low is. How about the others, please? 
if you, if you know them. If you have Very income. low, it's uh, 0 to 30 percent of the median income. Uh, low is 30 to 60 percent of the median income for the county of Los Angeles. Um, it's based basically on county because other counties may have different median income, so it's based on the on LA County. And moderate? Moderate, I'm not sure it's defined. It's, uh, we, we can probably, we don't have those numbers in front of us right now, but we can probably get you something that shows you at least what the percentages are. Um, it's not something we deal with on a daily basis. We, we just rely on HUD. Well, maybe numbers. I could just Google median income for LA County. It's, and get you'd there. probably come up, yeah. Right. Okay. If yes. you have any difficulties, let us know. We can, we can find we Thank can find you very it. much. All right. And excuse me for interrupting you. I actually have that information probably with me. Um, Let me look through it. Uh, it's right here. Oh. Okay, I'm sorry. Um, extremely low income is zero to thirty percent. Um, very low income is uh, fifty of the of the medium income, and uh, lower income, I guess, to what they consider moderate, it's um, eighty, and above moderate, it's one hundred and twenty percent. Thank you. And actually, I think that's also included in the technical report that you will be getting on the housing when the draft housing element is prepared. <clears throat> Again, um, certain segments of the population may have more difficulty finding decent, affordable housing due to their special needs. Special needs groups include the elderly, disabled persons, large households, female headed households, and homeless. Jurisdiction responsibility, a city is required to facilitate and create opportunities for housing. What does a housing element not do? It does not require the city to build housing. Again, I want to emphasize that is the state recognizes that the role of, of a city is not to build housing, but to create the opportunities and to facilitate um, development through their policies. State housing element law requires the quantification of the existing and projected housing needs for all income levels. This includes extremely low income households and extremely low income household is defined as zero to 30% of the area medium income for LA County. Um, amended housing law uh, includes more specific requirements Land inventory must specifically include parcel specific listing of available sites, including the parcel number and the map showing the location of the sites. The resources and opportunities of the housing element provides a map of the vacant and underutilized lands that could potentially be used to accommodate affordable housing. Again, doesn't mean it's going to be built. The city just has to facilitate. The staff has to look at the city where those opportunity sites um, are available, what is being underutilized, what could be, what is ready to be redeveloped. Um, basically, that's an exercise that the city goes through in drafting the housing element. Emergency, emergency shelters, um, Senate Bill 2 requires local jurisdictions to identify at least one zone where emergency shelters are permitted. And as B520 requires reasonable accommodation, that was something that came to, uh, an ordinance came to Planning Commission, um, I think back in April 24th, and uh, the Planning Commission recommended approval to City Council, and that will be considered by City Council next week. And that um, the city um, drafted um, reasonable accommodation ordinance. May I ask where the emergency shelter is? The emergency shelter where the city has identified 
to be allowed by rights in the manufacturing zone and the M1 zone. That, that's, that's what the, that's what we're contemplating. That's what we have been contemplating, but the code has not been changed. That would be a discussion. That would be a code amendment that would have to take place here at the Planning Commission at City Council for it to, the housing element itself doesn't change the code. You have to still do code amendments to meet those regulations that you're establishing in there. So this is new. There's nothing that we're Yeah, there's nothing in place now. It's, it would be new, yes. Okay, and as part of the governmental constraint analysis of the housing element uh, law, the city must analyze and include the housing, um, the housing element discusses establishing reasonable accommodation procedures such as modification to processes, materials, and procedures to enable an individual with a disability to fully participate in activities which will provide, um, provide them with equal oppor op housing opportunities. Climate change, Senate Bill 375, we actually had a study session in the past with the, with the commission on this, requires jurisdictions to adopt a sustainable communities strategy to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and align housing and transportation planning. The housing element was uh, normally required to be updated every five years because they are aligning the housing element updates with the regional transportation plan. Now it's going to be required to be updated every eight years. Um, there are penalties um, that are included in SB 375 if we do not update our housing element and adopt, um, have a certified housing element. Uh, which will require jurisdictions to prepare a housing element update every four years instead of eight. So that is the penalty. Um, so it's in the city's best interest to have a, a certified housing element to avoid that. Regional housing needs assessment, known, known as RENA. The arena quantifies the need for housing within each jurisdiction during specified planning periods and is distributed by income group based on a percentage of the area's medium income. So the units that were assigned to the city of West Covina were 2,462 for the planning period of 2008 through 2014. The housing element is the mechanism that local governments use to adequately plan to meet their existing and projected housing needs, including their share of the original housing need. The housing element not only identifies the existing housing needs of a jurisdiction's residents, but also indicates how it will accommodate the original housing allocation arena assigned to it. The annual median income for Los Angeles County, uh, this is in 2011, 2012, is $69,200. And income limits are adjusted by household size for each group. The housing element update process. Um, we have the background technical report. We had the initial community input, which was back in December 9th, 2008. Draft housing element. Um, once the draft housing element, it, um, in this case, we will, will have it um, released for public review as well as for review from planning commission and elected officials. Uh, we have to also complete sequence analysis and we will hold public hearings at a planning commission level and city council level. Obviously, city council is the, the body that will adopt um, the housing element. And then we send the housing element back to the state for certification. Um, there is a lot more work to be done even after that because there are uh, policies that are required, um, rezoning, code amendment, so um, that it's part of the work, but that's not it. It continues. <laughs> housing element um, has a progress report, which evaluates the appropriateness, effective, effectiveness, and progress of the goals set in the previous housing element. It also has the community profile that reveals population and employment trends in the city to inform housing policy. 
Housing needs assessment provides information on the following household characteristics, housing stock condition, housing need for all income groups, and housing need for special needs residents. All of that will be included in the draft housing element, so all of that will be um, addressed. Housing constraints analysis, governmental constraints, non-governmental constraints, barriers to the development of housing for all income levels, including people with disabilities. It also includes an inventory of land suitable for residential development. As I mentioned previously, um, that is a requirement of state law. Vacant residential sites, underdeveloped residential sites that could be redeveloped at a higher density. Vacant and underutilized sites that can be rezoned for residential development. And um, obviously we've done a little bit of, we already have one project in which we did this, which is the WIC site was rezoned and is being developed with a mixed use which has commercial as well as residential units above um, the commercial or ground floor. Housing plan, the goals is broad statements based on community desires, it includes policies, specific standards, and our targets focus on achieving a goal. Um, it also includes programs and its implementation measures. Uh, five year schedule of specific actions and tasks that the city will employ to put each goal and associated policies in action. I'd like to talk about that for a moment. Sure. Me, because when I was reading the backup material, I stopped at that point and said, a five year schedule of specific actions. Now, I looked at the RHNA schedule and it shows that we're pitifully low in accomplishing everything but the category of above moderate. And so it seems to me that, I, has there been a five year schedule before this or is this again something new that we're? Again, these are policies. The, cities, the city can only facilitate, the role of the city is basically having policies that I will encourage. In the past with redevelopment funds, there were the 20% set aside, which was used um, to, or assisted developers in developing the senior housing. Um, but now, you know, I don't think the state can expect um, cities to be able to facilitate or subsidize um, low, very low and low income housing, especially when all of our funds have been rated. So unless another state brings another program to encourage that and cities be able to use those funds to facilitate that, not only through policies, but also through financial incentives, um, you're absolutely right. Um, but again, there are no penalties as long as we facilitate the land to build those units. It doesn't mean we have to build them. As long as we, are, we, have, we have identified um, parcels where those units could be developed, that's, that's our, our role. I hope I answered your question. Yeah, yeah okay. you did, and I appreciate that. Well, and one follow-up to that. I, probably the five-year time frame there is because in the past, the time frame for the housing element and the RENA numbers was five years. So what, what the idea was is that every five years, you'd be reviewing your housing element, determining if you needed to change the programs and policies that you had in place. Now we're going to be, now we're going to be on a schedule where every eight years. So it'll be an eight-year uh, uh, period where you're reevaluating. The benefits of a certified element include timely access to state infrastructure bonds for capital improvement projects, redevelopment initiative implementation, which I'm not sure that's going to be there anymore, access to CBD, um, CDBG and home funds, um, directing growth in the community, achieving a jobs housing balance, reducing traffic impacts, and retaining a local employment base. Yes. This cycle um, is going to be 2000, I think it's 2014 to 2022, is it? 
I think that's correct, yeah. We, we haven't had a lot of focus on the next cycle. They call these cycles. We've been primarily focused on this cycle, which is 2008 to 2014. So I agree with Fabiola. I'm not sure if we have it anywhere in the staff report, but I think it's to 2014 to 2022. Okay, thank you. One other, one other quick question while you're here, and I, I don't know if it's a typo or what, but you're talking about RHNA, which stands for Regional Housing Need Allocation, right? Okay, on page three you've got Regional Housing Need Assessment. Is that it's assessment, not allocation. The correct term is assessment. So through, through all this report where you say RHNA need allocation should be assessment? So we've got both ways in the staff report, but it's assessment, I'm pretty sure is the, the correct. I it was allocation. <laughs> I'm pretty sure it's assessment, but the, it's a description is the allocation. Okay. You have, you're, you're required to allocate or provide capacity for those number of units. Right. And then the assessment is where we stand. The assessment is what's made by the state to determine what each community's allocation is. Okay. Thank you. Okay, consequences of an uncertified element include ineligibility for housing fund and possible future transportation funds if the state wanted to penalize any jurisdiction they could do that. It also leaves um, a jurisdiction open to lawsuits which could lead to a court takeover of the planning department that has happened in the past but usually in the Bay Area jurisdictions. And loss of redevelopment set aside funds which they were already taken, but had nothing to do with the housing element. Um, and um, anyway, another of the uh, related topics on the housing element is um, to upgrade older units and complexes, mixed-use projects, and also allowing second units. Um, those are things that the city can do to encourage um, affordable housing or just more housing opportunities overall. Um, the next steps. We will be bringing you a draft housing element for your review. It will be, um, in this case, we're not going to transmit it to um, the housing community development, the state housing community development yet. We're actually going to um, have the public hearings. So we can do a little bit of a different um, order. And uh, once we have all the public hearings, if city council does adopt the housing element, we will be submitting it to the state um, for certification. And again, this will be the housing element update for the period of 2008 to through th 2014. And, um, and this is also known as the fourth cycle of the housing element. Um, that concludes my presentation, and if you have any questions, I will attempt to answer them. You're welcome. I didn't jump in there because I had a little head start on everybody in the commission. In fact, I was on the uh, 2008 uh, commission when it started. Uh, i just say one thing about it. This is a very important thing between the city and the state. And it's kind of a behind the scenes thing as far as the residents are concerned. Most of them probably don't even care about it, but it's a very important thing. Uh, staff has a lot to do to catch up to what we need to get this uh, started. And uh, that's why I allowed the questions to go through the commission because before you, instead of waiting to the end there. But uh, anybody else that has any questions are welcome to, welcome to ask uh, Kev Fabiola right now. Let me just, um, I'm not sure if Fabiola mentioned Hogel Ireland. You see the name Hogel Ireland up there. That's the consulting firm that we've, we've, uh, and, and it's important to understand that because um, we're not experts. You know, we're kind of jack of all trades. We're doing all kinds of different things. But, but the consultants, we hire the consultant because they're an expert. That's that's what they focus on. That's what they know. They know. So we rely on them for a lot of the knowledge base that, and and what other communities have have used to be able to get certified by HCD, the state agency that, ha that is required to certify it. Right, thank you. <clears throat> Any other questions at all? Yes, Mr. Chairman. All right. Uh, on that same report, uh, on page um, six, under next steps, it says a draft of the housing element has been completed. 
Is that something that's planned? You're in, in your planning to bring to us, or is it something we can have now? Or no. Well, yes and no. <laughs> we we have been working on this since uh, 2008. So we have had things com partially completed or drafts completed, probably since 2009 or 2010. So we've been we've been in process. Um, we can't bring it to you at a public hearing until we complete the CEQA analysis, the California Environmental Quality Act analysis. So just like we, we are working on lots of projects, which we have in our offices and we look at every day and we're, you know, we're researching and, and evaluating, but until we have the CEQA done, we can't, put, uh, we can't do a noticing and, and have a public hearing. So that's what we need to wait for. And, and you're not, and the Planning Commission isn't, isn't supposed to be evaluating something until they have all the information. So they need all the environmental information as well as all the information on the, the, the housing document. So that, that's why it's not available yet. And that's why, we're, that's why Fabiola presented the schedule that she presented. That's when we think everything will be ready for your evaluation. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you. Any more questions of staff or anyone? Okay, seeing none, we'll go ahead and move on to the uh, next study session, which is number six on our agenda here, uh, conditional use permits. And we also have a staff report. Give me one second. This will be a, probably a shorter report. Perhaps we can hold our questions till the end and make it a little easier. Yeah, yeah. that's easier. Um, I think uh, it is fairly short. Um, this is a study session to go over the purpose of conditional use permits, just to give uh, the planning commissioners a background um, because of the, the, the new commissioners that we have. Um, the West Covina Municipal Code establishes rules for reviewing various types of activities or improvements. So I'm going to sort of start out with in a general sense and then, then we'll move into the um, and, and focus a little bit more on, on conditional use permits. There are activities that are allowed by right. In other words, the applicant has a right to, to, to um, uh, construct such an improvement as long as they meet the other development standards like setbacks and height and size, those kind of things. Um, there are other types of permits or improvements that require what, what we refer to as a discretionary approval or discretionary review. And discretionary review means that someone has the ability or the authority to say no. And that, that, that someone can run the gamut from uh, myself. I have the authority as a planning director in some cases. We have staff boards that also have the authority in some cases. We have the planning commission who has authority in some cases. And we have the city council who has authority in some cases. So th there's a range of, of those type of activities and who has the authority for the discretionary review. So by right is, is sort of, that's the two categories, things that are by right and things that are discretionary. Things that are by right for residential include patio covers and single story room additions at the rear of the house, air conditioner uh, improvements and plumbing improvements for a single family house. If somebody comes in and, and wants to change their water heater in their house, we don't take it to a board and say, no, we don't think that's a good idea. They, they are allowed to do that by right. Um, in terms of commercial, there's, there's fewer things that are by right commercial, but there are some things uh, such as plumbing and electrical up upgrades and interior kind of improvements to, to um, existing commercial buildings. The municipal code includes many types of permits that require review and approval by different staff members. Um, decisions on who reviews what has been made by the city council over the years since, since the city was formed. So it hasn't been made by the city council. To set, all the decisions haven't been made by the city council this setting now. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's an evolving, it's an evolving um, set of standards that, that changes over time. Um, one of the most prevalent types of permits that the Planning Commission deals with is the conditional use permit, or what we sometimes refer to as a CUP by its acronym. A conditional use permit is required for certain types of activities that could have a negative effect on surrounding property. So that's the reason that it's a CUP, not because it's bad or because it's evil or something like that, just because it could have a negative effect. And sometimes we find that the CUP, the way it's situated or the way it's, the type of activity it's going to run, it doesn't, it isn't going to have any effect, but we still need to go through the CUP process. Other times the decision might be made that it has too much effect and therefore it's not appropriate to approve in that location. Um, the municipal code therefore requires a public hearing before the planning commission and notice is sent to uh, owners and residents within 300 feet of the subject property. The conditional use permit, as it sounds, allows that 
allows for conditions to be placed on the use uh, to permit it to, I'm just using the words in a different order, but, but to permit it to, to, uh, to operate in the, in, the, in the location that's proposed. The Planning Commission, as we've discussed, has the ability to approve, continue, or deny any conditional use permit public hearing that comes before them. If approved, um, there is generally a list of conditions that are required to be abided by. And one of the reasons we had the, uh, the item on the consent calendar this evening on Amazing Lights is because that was a conditional use permit. And it had conditions and there was some level of concern, mostly because it was an, uh, a newer, unusual type of activity that we're not, none of us that we reviewed it were familiar with. So we're, there was some level of concern that they might not abide by their conditions. That's why the three-month review and then the additional six-month review were placed on there because we wanted to ensure that they were following their conditions. In that case, it appears that they are following their conditions. If we found a, a situation where someone was not following their conditions of approval, there's, a, there's something called a revocation procedure that can be started and go through and remove that conditional use permit. That's, that's, a, that's, a, um, that's a way to remove or eliminate the, the conditional use permit permit to begin with. But I would warn you on that that it's, it's, it's a lot more difficult than it sounds. As the, the city attorney uh, discussed with me one time, it's much easier to grant a conditional use permit than it is to take one away. Or stated another way, it's much easier to deny a conditional use permit than to allow it to see how it works and then try to take, to, to take that right away. It might take years to actually come up with the evidence and go through the proceedings. And it's, it's basically a legal issue to go through the revocation proceedings. The municipal code is divided up into several sections, and one of those sections is uh, non-residential. The non-residential section of the code deals with uh, commercial and industrial activity, and most uses that require a conditional use permit are commercial business operations, although there are some exceptions. There are some residential uh, types of improvements that do require a conditional use permit, but by far most of them are, are commercial type of activities. In the code, and I've provided it for you in attachment one, and it's a little confusing because that, that code is sort of a running code, so it, you know, there's no beginning or end. I've just provided you several pages in the midst of it. But the matrix is is, is a very important document for the planning department. Uh, that's what tells us what category of use, what requ requires what type of discretionary review, or if it's an allowed use and it's allowed by right. Um, and, and I provided that on the... On the, on the slide behind us. I just want to kind of cover that a little bit, just so you know. This is just the first, a portion of the first page, and there's, I didn't count them, there's six or eight pages to the matrix. So it's a very detailed uh, list of uses. And, and, and as, as you can understand that there are new uses all the time, I'm not even sure what we came up with to describe what the use that Amazing Lights was, but it, it was basically what I think I would refer to as finger dancing. Uh, and it's not something that would have been in, in the matrix because who would have ever thought we would have a business where someone's doing finger dancing? What did you say? Well, we, we categorize as live entertainment because it is entertainment with music. Um, but but what my point there is that there are new types of business activities that come up, and they're not in the matrix. So sometimes we have to determine if it's similar to a use that's in the matrix. Sometimes we find a determination that it is. Other times we find a determination that it's not similar to any use in the matrix, and therefore it's not allowed. If it's not in the matrix or similar to use in the matrix, it's not allowed. It has to be listed in that. And then therefore, sometimes we'll bring uses before you. Several years ago, and Dave may recall this, I'm not sure uh, any of the others of you would, we brought something uh, called hookah before you, which is a uh, water pipe, as I understand it, which is kind of a Mediterranean, Middle Eastern type of activity. It's traditional. Um, it's not in the code. There's nothing like it in the code. At the time, the Planning Commission decided they didn't think it was appropriate to allow in the city, so we didn't allow it. So when people call us and ask us if they can open a hookah bar, we say no. It's, the Planning Commission considered it, said no, and so it's not allowed. That, that's an example of how that happens. So what you see here is you see that we have all kinds of uses listed here, and these acronyms up here are, are various zoning standards. So the R's and the M's, this, these first six, are residential. I'm not going to go into those very much because you can understand that most of the uses that are allowed in the, in the, in the M or the R zones are, um, are residential type uses. Um, as we go over here, th these six are commercial uses and then these two are industrial uses. And this, is, this is public buildings or civic uses and this is open space. So by far most of the uses are in these two, in these two columns right here. 
Um, if we go, we go to the first one, it lists a C. C means conditional use permit. So if somebody comes in and says, I want to open a daycare center on Hollenbeck and Garvey, is, can I do that? The planner opens up the book and says, well, let's see, that means you need a conditional use permit. It's a public hearing before the planning commission, 300 foot radius, and, and they know what it is. It's not, some, it's, not, it's not like the used car salesman where you go in the back room and talk to the guy and try to make a deal with him. It's, it's all there in, in the book and, and we just, we, we're just telling them what the book says. Um, I've forgotten what B is. What's B? Oh, well, B. This adult oriented business, that, that's unusual. That it has its own category. That's why I can't remember what that was. We're going to skip that for the time being. Uh, this, this list here, the X's, and you'll see a lot of X's around. This page has fewer than most. X's are allowed uses. So that means they're about by right. As I talked about, there's no discretionary review on that. If somebody wants to open an art studio in, in any one of these four zones, they're allowed to. And we can't tell them no, even if there's three art studios in a row, this guy's right in the middle of them and everybody's complaining because there's too many art studios. That's not a choice that the planning, commission, the planning commission or the planning department can make. It's allowed by right. They have the right to open that business. Um, and an A use is an administrative use permit, which is very similar to a conditional use permit, except for it, it, it's reviewed by staff. But it still requires noticing and we can still put conditions on it. Um, and those are usually less intensive uses, uses that we think might have an effect but are less likely to have a very strong or uh, lasting effect on the neighboring properties. Let's see, did I go through? Those are the ones I wanted to kind of go through here. The, the other one we have here, I think, on this page is the P use, which is a planning, deck, planning director's review. Yeah. Yeah. On, the, on page 1824 of, of this one, the explanation. Yes. Uh, it gives, you know, what the X and the asterisk is, except for the last one, the hole punch went through it. That's the B. Be like in boy? <laughs> yes, be like in boy. Okay. And it, as luck would have it, that's what's on the page in front of you here on the overhead. Okay. So it's, it's, it's the adult-oriented business. The other thing, this is an excellent tool and all that. I wonder if we could get a decoding sheet of what the top things are. The RA, the R1, the MF8 sure. and all that. I mean, that would be really helpful to me where you could use sure. this matrix. I know you know what it is because you use it every yeah, day. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Because this in itself is really a very handy tool, I think. Okay, let me, I'll try to get a memo to you at the next meeting. Thank you. Sir? Yes? You say that the matrix is static. It doesn't change. Well, the, it can change. It requires a code amendment, which is a code amendment that, it's, first of all, it's initiated by either the Planning Commission or City Council. Second of all, it's a public for the. Second of all, it has to come before the planning commission and be approved by the council before it can change. So it's it's a fairly arduous by 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 um, by design. Yeah, it's arduous. It's not meant. It's sort of like Congress. You know, it's not meant to be easy. It's meant to require a lot of forethought. But it, it does change, and it can change. If someone came in and wanted to establish an electronic game store, and there are a lot of those around. What category do you put them in? I couldn't find it in the listing. You're talking about a, um, a game. A, Where they sell the uh, games. Yeah, video, video games. Video. I think we would just put that purely under retail. Okay. Yeah, I think it's just, I think we just called it retail, didn't we? Oh, yes, it's on, it's on page 1830 at the third, third row down. It says retail general. We did simplify this a couple of years. We didn't used to have the retail standard, but about four years ago, I think we, we, we changed the code to add retail. So that those kind of businesses, it wasn't too confusing. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions while I? Okay, so that gives you an idea of the matrix. And I wanted you to understand the matrix as part of this, this CUP discussion, the conditional use permit discussion. Um, I also kind of wanted to, we, we did some, uh, uh, going back and looking over the last couple of years, uh, Lydia and I, about uh, knowing what kind of conditional use permits we've had that have been brought before the Planning Commission, so you have an idea of the type of things you see. If you look through that matrix, there's a lot of things that are listed as conditionally permitted uses. But I'll tell you that probably at least half and maybe 75% of them we rarely see applications for. But there are others that, were, that are fairly common. Um, we had multiple applications in the last two and a half years for conditional use permits for wireless cell towers, for churches, for convenience stores at gas stations, 
for gyms, fitness clubs, uh, and for live entertainment in conjunction with a restaurant, and for drive through facilities. Now, some of those things are cyclical, um, like the convenience stores at service stations. You know, I think that that's been a very um, market-driven thing that over the past years, a lot of service stations have tried to convert their bays or, uh, or, or just add at a convenience store. But it seems to me, at looking at the service stations we have in town, we're probably not going to have too many more because most of them have already done that. Um, other things that we've had singular applications for over the last two and a half years, daycare, ch children's daycare, uh, game arcades, billiards, uh, business trade schools, tattooing, and a veterinary office. <clears throat> so conditional use permits are one of the most common types of discretionary permits that, that the Planning Commission reviews. It's very common for cities across the state of California to have a conditional use permit process. I've worked for four different cities in my career. Uh, every one of them had a conditional use permit process. If I talk to people in Northern California, they know what that is. It's not unique to West Covina. It is, it's pretty standard across California. Um, the Municipal Code grants the authority to determine whether a conditional use permit is appropriate to the Planning Commission, and any decision that the Planning Commission makes uh, on a conditional use permit can be appealed to the City Council. So either by the applicant or by a neighboring property owner who thinks that it's not appropriate, it can be appealed. There is a fee for that. So that, that brings me to the conclusion of, of this presentation. I'd sure be happy to answer any other questions if you had any. Any other questions? Well, I, I noticed the difference. I noticed there's two items. One's called daycare center and one's called adult day centers. Yep. And of course, we're as we get older, finding a lot more of that activity in the last 10 to 15 years than we ever did before. True. Uh, and yet, I see they're both uh, require conditional use permits. Yes, they both do. They, they have different, you know, they have different issues surrounding them. Clearly, children's daycare has a, a, probably a lot more noise associated with an adult daycare, but there might be more activity in terms of um, health-related issues that, that might surround um, an adult daycare. But they're they're both listed there, but they are separate and different, distinct type of uses because they have distinct types of um, possible effects. And, and we, we've had both. We've gone to, we, we, there was a time, probably about 10 years ago, when we had lots of them. I think we had four or five of them that were applied for and approved. It's been a while since we've had one, but yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? <clears throat> I might mention for the three new uh, commissioners, the amazing lights are gloves that go in your hands with lights in the end of them, and they yes. dance in the dark. I think, in fact, I think Mr. Redwell's bought some of those. Did you, did you, could you bring them and show them to us? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that's what it is. Any more questions for uh, staff? You could probably, if you're really interested, you, they had it on, uh, that websites with videos. Yeah. Um, they were, they're very interesting to see how they do it. They're very unique the way they move their hands. It's not, it's not just doing this, you know. No, they were, they're really dancing. It's not They get a huge, huge crowd there, too, in the weekends. Yeah. Commissioner, you have a question? Okay, I thought you said, okay, anybody else? All right, seeing none then, we'll go ahead and uh, close the uh, book on the uh, study sessions tonight. And we'll move on to uh, oral communications again. Anybody, last questions, last chances? Seeing none. Okay, do we have any commissioner reports and comments? Miscellaneous items, anybody? Yeah, I, Commissioner Holtz. Yeah, I, I just want to go on record. I talked to Jeff about this on... Uh, by my house on Holland Beck and Holland Crest, the water company has a facility. Is it on? Is it on? There you go. Uh, start over again. On Holland Beck and Holland Crest, the water company, I'm not too sure which one it is, has uh, land there. And about five to six years ago, there was a big storage water tank there that they tore down, and there was no activity there uh, up until this date. And about two to three months ago, uh, all of a sudden there's been horrendous activity there where they're uh, using all types of heavy-duty equipment, uh, back hoes, making cement, uh, all kinds of trucks, 18-wheelers coming in and out of there. And uh, to make it worse, they tore or they cut down a lot of the trees that used to hide that facility. And now you see quite an ugly cyclone or a, a chain-link fence there. So I've asked Jeff to go to Shannon and find out, you know, just what's going on. I think it's part of the Reclam uh, what do you call it? The, uh, uh, the rec reclaimed water. Reclaimed water. The, the, you, you see them tearing up the streets in, in the city. 
But I don't know how long that's going on, and I don't think that really is a place that they should be uh, using that type of equipment and facilities right in the neighborhood. So Jeff has agreed to go to Shannon and find out what's going on. I just wanted to go on public record and asking him to do that. Thank you. Any other comments? All right, seeing none, we'll go ahead and move on to the uh, planning director's report. We have uh, two sets of subcommittee minutes for June 12th and June 26th um, on for your information. And the city council will be reviewing the reasonable accommodation code amendment that came before the planning commission late April, I think, probably before the change. Um, but it is going to the city council. Hopefully they will uh, adopt that. And that will bring us one step closer to meeting all the goals of the housing element. Okay, thank you. Did you combine the uh, planning director's report and the city council action all in one? Did you? I did. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I guess I'm in a hurry. <laughs> next meeting. Yeah. I'm sorry? What's the date of their next meeting? Because I know they canceled a few. City the, council? Yeah, they're, they're meeting on the 17th. A week from tonight, they'll be okay. meeting. A week from tonight, right. Mm -hmm. uh, Commissioner Menefee mentioned the last, our last meeting about why do we have a, uh, uh, just before this meeting, we had design review. And actually, one of the important things about it was we had some design reviews and we didn't have a meeting. We had, even though we didn't have this meeting, we had design review that same night. So it expedites getting people's, you know, approval ahead. That's, that's one of the reasons we have it. I just didn't mention that last time. Any other thing? Anybody else? Anything else? If not, we'll go ahead and uh, entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Commissioner Medellin? Second. Second by Commissioner Valles. All in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Nope. Thank you very much.